Hi everyone, this is Melissa Wiley and I'm here with Ennis Davis and Corian Delane. And we are so excited to share with you all the story of one of Florida's fascinating stories and how historic preservation, urban planning and community development is revitalizing a historic city. So I wanted to share a little bit about the other folks on the panel with me today. We have Corian Delane, who is an urban planner and the city planner for the city of Opelika the interim CRA manager at Opelika Community Redevelopment Agency and the Main Street Opelika Executive Director. He has experience working with multiple municipalities, organizations, and nonprofit entities. Previously, he worked with the city of Miramar as a city planner that assisted in the rewriting of their land development regulations and as an urban planner with Liberia Economic and Social Development. Corian is well-versed in urban development, but also in community engagement and participation. He is a graduate of the Florida State University, completed the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce's Leadership Miami program, the Urban Land Institute's Leadership Institute program, is a member of the Florida State University chapter of Progressive Black Men, and also I am pleased to say a member of the Florida Trust Board of Directors. Ennis Davis is a senior planner with Alfred Bench and Company. He is a civic activist dedicated to improving communities and is also the vice president of membership and outreach for the Florida chapter of the American Planning Association. He is also a Florida Trust for Historic Preservation trustee. He serves as our treasurer and our chair for the 11 to Save Committee. He is a Groundwork Jacksonville board member, author of the award-winning books, Reclaiming Jacksonville, Cohen Brothers, The Big Store and Images of Modern America, Jacksonville, and co-founder of online media publications, The Jackson Mag and Modern Cities. So we're so ex excited to have those folks with us today. And I just wanted to let you know really quick about the Florida Trust. We are um, Florida statewide preservation nonprofit based in Tallahassee. And my name is Melissa Wiley and I'm the CEO and president of our organization. I'm happy to do that. Um, just a little bit more about me. Um, actually, interestingly, Ennis and Corian and I are all actually natives of Florida. We were all born here, which can be a little uh, unique. There's a lot of transplants to Florida, but we are all um, native Floridians, which is pretty cool. I was born in Clearwater, Florida, and that's the image that you can see at the top left there is a picture, historic postcard of, of Clearwater. It was originally the home of the Tocobega people, and around 1835, the United States Army began construction of Fort Harrison as an outpost during the Seminole Wars. It was on a bluff overlooking Clearwater Harbor in an area known today as Harbor Oaks, and that's where my dad grew up. His house was built around 1950, and that area is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, the middle picture there is a picture of myself and my sister, my cousin, in front of that house um, in Clearwater. And I'm sharing that with you guys um, because this is the place where I learned of the importance of the built environment and how it can share our stories. And if we lose these places, we can also lose our abilities to connect and tell these stories in the same way. When my grandmother passed away when I was young, um, we the house was sold and demolished. And listening to my father talk, I grew up feeling like a double loss from losing my grandmother and losing the house. Um, so this is the place that taught me the, the power of our built environment to share our stories and our history, which has powered me through my career. And I think it's also a kind of underlying theme for the story of Opalaka as well. So before we start speaking specifically about Opalaka, I wanted to set up this idea of what we're talking about here in Florida at this time. To me, this time period was like Florida and living the dream. Like people were coming to Florida from everywhere you might wanna imagine, as long as they had money, they had the ability to create these amazing dreamscapes um, of anything they wanted. So the picture here is the Cotizan, which was built by John and Mabel Ringling in Sarasota in 1924. Mabel wanted a home in the Venetian Gothic style of the Palazzi in Venice, Italy, and there was no re reason that she couldn't make that a reality. So they built this home in Sarasota and the Sarasota Bay became her Grand Canal. So they're just living the dream there in Sarasota. Also live in the dream were the railroad barons who came to Florida and there was nothing stopping those folks from making Florida into their own little um, wonderland or architectural dreams. Uh, first up, you see the Hotel Ponce de Leon in St. Augustine. That was um, done by Henry Flagler, who headed the Florida East Coast Railway. 
and he completed the Overseas Railroad, connecting the entire east coast of Florida from Jacksonville to Key West, so it was quite a feat, on a single railroad system. He saw Florida's tourism potential, and in 1888 built the Hotel Ponce de Leon. It was the first of, in a series of luxury resorts along Florida's east coast, so we're bringing people now to experience the wonder and dreams that is Florida. Uh, and as you can see, the architecture is a masterpiece of Spanish Renaissance architecture and the first major port in place concrete building in the United States. Um, the next image is the Tampa Bay Hotel, which is in Tampa, Florida, and that was done by Henry Plant. Uh, his plant investment company acquired existing rail lines and laid new track into central and western Florida. He wanted to connect railroads with ports to feed a tourism boom that he also saw happening in Florida. Um, naturally, he wanted his empire to have a palace, and that palace was the Tampa Bay Hotel. It was designed to surpass all other grand winter resorts with ornate Victorian gingerbread and topped by Moorish minarets, domes, and cupolas. Interestingly, both of these buildings still exist in Florida, and they are both part of universities that have um, sought to restore and continue to utilize these buildings. So the Hotel Ponce de Leon is part of Flagler University, and the Tampa Bay Hotel is part of the University of Tampa. So another really um, amazing feat, architectural feat, an example of dreaming in Florida is Opalaca. Uh, and what we're seeing here is that Florida really is a place where rich people can come to create whatever they dream of. Um, and before we get into the details too much of Opalaca, I wanted to thank Matt Marino, who wrote a story for our Preservationist magazine that really delved into the history of Opalaca. Um, I shared a lot of, a lot of his insight will be shared in this presentation. So thank you, Matt, for all your research. So perhaps the dreamiest of the dreamers of people who came to Florida to create uh, alternate realities was Glenn Curtis. And he was an aviation pioneer who was called the fastest man in the world because in 1907, he hit 136.3 miles per hour on a self-built motorcycle cruising down Ormond Beach, which is also in Florida. He founded the Curtis Airplane and Motor Company in 1910, which was the first US licensed aircraft manufacturer, sold the first US private aircraft, before becoming the world's largest aviation company. He actually bought out the Wright brothers and formed the Curtis Wright Corporation, invented the seaplane, airboat, and aerocar, built the first U.S. Navy aircraft, and trained the Navy's first two pilots. So eventually, Curtis grew to be a land developer, and his eyes settled on South Florida. On Tequesta and later Seminole lands was a place called Opa Tishiwakalaka, or high ground amid the swamp on which there is a camping place. And that is the place that he would build his dream city. So to me, Opalaca stands as one of Florida's most fascinating cities. It has one of the largest, if not the largest, collection of Moorish Revival architecture in America. In 1982, it was added to the National Register of Historic Places as a thematic resource area. It was dreamed as a North African fantasy land with a dazzling uh, central building, a main street functioning as an open market bazaar, and I can't even count how many minarets there must have been up in, up in Opalaka back in the day. It was said to have been inspired by 1001 Arabian Nights, the, the stories, um, and traveling there was meant to be like traveling to a different place outside of America, a, a kind of a dreamland. So in 1927, when Seaboard Airlines Orange Blossom Special arrived, a band of horsemen in Arabian-themed garb halted the great iron horse with a proclamation from the Grand Vizier of the Empire of Opalaka, who, who was actually J. Carl Adams, a half-brother and investor in Opalaka with Curtis. Um, and this event marked the height of the city's popularity when it was embodying the dream it was advertised to be. And the, the picture on the left there is obviously the cover of Arabian Nights, and the image on the right is that uh, train station in Opalaka. So... Opa Tishiwakalaka was swallowed up by a 120,000 acre purchase by the Curtis Bright Corporation, which carved from its holdings three cities, uh, Hialeah, then, then Country Club Estates, now Miami Springs, and then the final development of Missouri cattle rancher James Bright and Curtis, which was Opalaka. The theme of Opalaka carried on with street names like Sultan, Alibaba, Sherazad, Aladdin, and Sesame. Curtis and architect Bernard Muller built 105 buildings with an array of domes, minarets, and outside staircases. By the time Curtis's dream was realized, Opalaka was a self-contained city with a hotel, zoo, golf course, archery club, swimming pool, airport, and train station. So Boomtown was a different uh, 
Boomtown Opelaka was a different kind of boomtown. I think there was two key things that differentiated it from other boomtowns in Florida. Um, funded by the Aviation Florida fortunes and built amidst the dizzying speculation of Florida's land boom, uh, Opelaka has two things that is different. Uh, one is its reliance on advertisements. So here is a few examples of the really interesting um, vintage uh, advertising that the city was using to get people to come there. So they wanted visitors, they wanted tourists, they wanted uh, folks to come and live there as well. So the town was platted to entice the seaboard rail line. Free buses brought visitors in from nearby Miami and potential residents were tempted with all those perks we talked about, archery ranges, pools, a zoo, and there was also um, adequate job opportunities at the local aero car plant and other businesses that they projected being a part of Opelaka. The other piece of what made uh, Opelaka different was its connection with the aviation industry. Obviously, with Curtis's history, this was going to be a place that was defined by aviation, which was his true passion. So an airfield for the Florida Aviation Camp opened in 1927. A dirigible mooring mass was added soon after that. What was then called Glenn Curtis Field would grow into Miami Municipal Airport. And very interestingly, in 1937, Amelia Earhart continued her infamous flight from that municipal airport. On July 2nd, obviously, Earhart and her navigator disappeared over the Pacific. So Opelaka's airport, uh, excuse me, yeah, municipal airport was then changed to Earhart Field in her honor. Another tie to the aviation industry was Curtis donated land for a Naval Reserve Air Base. By December 1944, then called Navy Municipal and Southfield Number no. 2, it was the second largest naval air training station in the United States and played a crucial role in World War II. By 1967, Opelaka was the busiest airport in the country. Opelaka's aviation facilities were central in the CIA's 1954 Guatemalan coup d'etat, the Bay of Pigs invasion, and Cuban Missile Crisis. Hurricane Andrew recovery efforts, and even 9-11, as, as many of you may know, the two hijackers trained at the airport 727 air simulator. The blimp hangar even housed Cuban refugees during the Mariel boat lift. And then, interestingly, it was blown for the climax of the 1995 motion picture Bad Boys. I'm sure we all remember that. So, unfortunately, the sort of dream of Opelaka did not last in its heyday for very long. It was devastated by the land boom crash in Florida, which began after an unusually cold winter in 1925, which was followed by an extremely hot summer. So, the worst of both worlds there. Rents started to skyrocket. People wrote letters back home saying maybe this isn't the greatest place to come to. Um, and then, of course, you had the Great Depression and all the economic hardships that were going to be a result of that. So people began to wonder if Florida was really a heaven on earth. <laughs> so the city was devastated by the great Miami hurricane in 1926, which further added to the struggles. Um, and that Navy base, which was a really great um, economic driver, um, it, that expansion continued unchecked and um, that decimated the native hammock that Curtis worked to preserve along with over 100 of those more structures that were originally built as part of the city. Um, from another e economic viewpoint, a little further down the road, the naval base closed and the city began to experience a decline. So there has been um, several years where these buildings have been, many of them, empty. And today, Opelaka is one of Miami's historically African-American communities working to grow back into a second um, economic growth period in a community development growth period. Opelaka actually became the first community in the United States to commemorate our first African-American president by renaming a mile-long section of Purvis Avenue from Oriental Boulevard to Alibaba Avenue, Barack Obama Avenue on February 17th of 2009. So that's a little bit about the unique history um, that has brought th this unique example of Florida to us. And now I'm going to turn it over to Corey and Delane, who's going to tell us a little bit more about where we are. Thank you. Um, so a little bit of background with uh, my involvement with preservation, especially in regards to, you know, helping the great city of Opelaka revitalize itself is uh, I come from a background of uh, preservationists, but also developers. 
Uh, my family, uh, for years, were restoring homes, building new homes, churches, and schools, dating back to the 1800s in rural Alabama and Mississippi. So we come from a long line of developers and individuals that had an extensive knowledge in restoration and new construction projects. So as we look forward in, you know, today's reality with the restoration of Opalaka, you know, this is something that has been a passion of mine. This is something that, you know, I've been able to look back at my heritage and at my family's history as something to lean on, you know, in my work with preservation. Um, in moving towards that conversation, you know, Opelaka is a city that has great potential. It has great history. Um, as Melissa mentioned, you know, Opelaka was built back in 1926 as a dream of aviation pioneer Glenn Curtis to be a, pretty much an oasis of South Florida as a means to create an environment where you know, individuals can come, live, work, and play area that was almost like a dream, uh, from the Moore's architecture to the zoos to the shopping complex in downtown, you know, the historic downtown that we're actually working to revitalize at this time. Um, Opalaka was a location unlike anywhere else in the world, even today, uh, with our largest collection of Moore's architecture in the Western Hemisphere as well as the airport, which was kind of its guiding light from the very onset, which of course, you know, the founder of our city was one of the aviation, one of aviation's initial pioneers. And it was pretty much his testing grounds for his early, earlier planes, such as the Curtis Jenny. So, you know, in our work, we want to make sure that we restore a lot of those buildings. Um, one of our challenges has been ensuring that the homes that have been constructed constructed, which are about 80 or so homes, um, are afforded opportunities for redevelopment. Uh, we have uh, had conversations with the state as well as the uh, federal government in regards to securing potential grants and loan programs to be able to afford that to our residents living in those homes. In regards to our other historic structures, our historic city hall is actually slated for completion um, during next year's, I believe it is uh, year 96 uh, anniversary. So we're very excited about that. Um, we also have our historic train station, which we will be actually activating um, at the end of this year during Art Basel as a holistic art complex with our one of our partnering organizations within the city, the Opalaka CDC. Um, so we're excited about the work that we're doing in restoring our great city. And we want to ensure that, you know, we have all the participants available, have our residents be a part and have our community partners be able to pour into the opportunities to assist us in the revitalization. Um, this has been an undertaking that I've been very proud to be a part of. It's something that I hold near and dear as uh, someone have, uh, that has grown up in the area. And I think that, you know, with the right team that we have, with our city manager, Mr. Darvin Williams, with our assistant city managers, Mr. Mecca Lawson and Mr. Uh, George Ellis, and, you know, the various departments at our city, we have the right team in place right now, as well as our elected officials, um, to really move this city forward uh, in regards to our restoration work. And that goes from our mayor, Ms. Veronica Williams, Vice Mayor John Taylor, um, our, our, our commissioners, Chris Davis, Adrian Dominguez and Commissioner Sh Dr. Shirlene Bass. Um, all of us are really working hard to make sure that we can continue our fight to uh, have our city back to its, its former glory. And we definitely can make sure that that happens in a timely fashion. So uh, I'm excited that we're actually able to present this in a national format. And I know that we're, we're, re we're ready and we're primed to move forward. And of course, if there's any other assistance out there, um, we're definitely more than willing to accept it. Uh, and we know that, you know, there are cities across the country that, you know, we, we love to lean on each other for our stories and experiences. We're definitely using the experience of other communities to help us move forward. And we also want to be, you know, a guiding light to other cities that have similar challenges in order to continue our preservation work. So once again, thank you all for this opportunity. And um, I'm looking forward to, you know, whatever else we have moving forward. So thank you. Thanks, Corian. Appreciate that. And glad to see all the work that's being conducted in uh, Opalaka. So as I get started, one of the things I like to do is always 
pay homage to my ancestors. I am a sixth generation uh, Floridian and I'm a Gullah Geechee descendant. And, you know, with that being said, um, without the sacrifices of my ancestors, I wouldn't have the opportunity to present in front of you today. And for those of you who may not know what Gullah Geechee means, it is basically uh, descendants of Africans that were enslaved in the Low Country, uh, basically from uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, south to St. Johns County, Florida, and about 30 miles inland. Um, as we move forward, uh, as I jump into this, one of the things that noted writer and activist James Baldwin has been quoted as saying is that great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, unconsciously controlled by it. History is literally present in all that we do. Acknowledging that fact that history is literally present in all that we do, uh, the Florida Trust to Restore Preservation's 11 to Save program is designed to increase the public's awareness of the urgent need to save Florida's historic resources and to empower local preservationists and preservation groups in the efforts to preserve Florida's rich history. The Florida's Trust for Historic Preservation's 11 to Save list spotlights the most threatened historic properties in the state and drives the Florida Trust education uh, initiatives and activation initiatives for the year ahead. So each year, the Florida Trust Analysis is 11 to Save program as part of its annual conference. Announced in July, this year's list represents endangered resources and properties in Alachua, Duval, Escambia, Gadsden, Lee, Leon, Monroe, Palm Beach, Polk, and Putnam counties, covering hundreds of years of history and a variety of cultural resources. Inclusion to this list is a starting point for advocacy and education efforts and is intended to be a part of a collaborative effort to identify custom solutions for each of the properties. Also, the Florida Trust maintains a partnership with Holly Baker, who is the assistant producer of Florida Frontiers, the weekly radio magazine of the Florida Historical Society, to share the story of each 11 to save site, as well as promote and bring more awareness to the 11 to save program on a consistent and regular basis. In addition, I'd like to share news about an exciting program and expansion um, of this 11 to save program. Last November, the Florida Trust Board of Directors announced the creation of 11 to save fund and provided an initial seed donation to begin support, financial support, for some of the most threatened historic resources uh, within our state. The fund is a response to needs that we have seen in our 11 to Save program and reflect our desire to further support and the assistance that we provide to each of the 11 to Save sites. So we are excited to be able to do more to preserve these historic resources because they really showcase how historic preservation can be a part of building a stronger, healthier community uh, throughout our entire state. This fund is intended to provide tangible and targeted assistance to each of the 11 to save properties throughout the state. And so over the past year, the 11 to Save Committee has worked to establish a process for rolling this program out. And launched this fall, we do anticipate awarding the first site later this month. Ongoing work in COSMO uh, serves as an example of a tangible and targeted assistance that we hope that we can provide to 11 to Save sites. A 2020 11 to save site, Cosmo is a community that was established at the end of the Civil War by former enslaved who were settled along the St. John's River, surviving by hunting, fishing, uh, farming, crabbing, and harvesting oysters. Over the course of the 20th century, uh, sprawl development would engulf most of this once rural community and landscape. 
In response, the Cosmo Preservation Association was formed to raise awareness about their community and the threats to its continued survival. So as a part of collective efforts with the National Park Service, the city of Jacksonville, the Jacksonville Gullah Geechee Nation CDC, the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission, and the Cosmo community, uh, the trust has worked to help plan, uh, dig up public history, and create and work on historic preservation strategies uh, in support of the community. So this has included raising public awareness through the Eleven to Save program, conducting oral history interviews with community elders, supporting the designation of the community cemetery to the National Register of Historic Places, and developing interpretive heritage markers in a new community heritage park that was dedicated this past March. Believing in the need to raise awareness for its restoration and rehabilitation, the Opalaka Administration Building in City Hall was added to the Eleven to Save program in 2021. As has been mentioned already, Opalaka was initially developed by Glenn Curtis, who was known by many as the father of naval aviation during the 1920s Florida land boom. At the heart of the community, the Opalaka Administration Building served as the headquarters for the development and sales company created by Curtis. Described as an anchor of the new city and completed in 1926, it was also the flagship in the center of town that would arrow out to other structures within city limits. It later became known as the Opalaka City Hall and was eventually placed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1982. A decade ago, this building was shuttered due to mold infestation. At the time, a renovation project had started, but due to lack of funds, the project was put on indefinite hold. As time has gone on, the stately structure has continued to deteriorate, which resulted in the building being included on the Leaven to Save program and the growing relationship that we now have with the city of Opalaka and the Florida Trust. So as an urban planner who was raised with the, in, in the historically ex excluded community and who also has a passion for working in historically excluded communities, I'm a huge believer in the work that is currently on our way in Opalaka, as it is a form of what I would call uh, with gentrification. And so in contrast to gentrification, uh, with gentrification basically refers to revitalization that is driven by people that are already living and working within the community. It means identifying assets in the community, bringing them together on the common objectives, uh, raising the value of that place from within at a pace that is appropriate for revitalization of the existing community as opposed to displacing that existing community. So in this initiative, residents in the business community actually take a leading role in revitalization rather than newcomers or outside developers telling the community what they need ultimately pricing them out in the process so to su successfully combat uh, gentrification we all must understand that every place has a significant historical story to tell if we are willing to find it as such, the toolbox of strategies used to address economic development while limiting uh, the negative impacts of displacement and preservation challenges will all be unique to each specific community. For example, Chicago's Bronzeville is a great role model for communities looking at ways to place keep their culture while also revitalizing. And established in 1825, Tallahassee's Frenchtown, which is one of the oldest historic African-American communities in the state, is home to successful examples of infill affordable uh, housing developments. And then there are Main Street programs such as Main Street in College Park, Georgia, and the Deuces in St. Pete, which are good examples of community uh, commercial revitalization efforts in manners that have retained that community's heritage and culture. So I'm happy to hear and know that Opalaka is also a Main Street program. And so they tend to say that access to information is power. So as a believer of that term, 
um, and the work that is underway in Opelaka, I'd like to end this part of the presentation uh, with another with gentrification example in hopes of spreading innovative strategies that can fuel revitalization and preservation while also retaining a community's culture across the country. So in recent years, Jacksonville's east side has launched an aggressive uh, with gentrification initiative to protect that community's um, character and unique sense of place as development pressure, pressure uh, encroaches uh, throughout its borders. Platted in 1869, the east side is a community that attracted freed men and freed women with employment opportunities at nearby sawmills and docks along the St. John's River. Initially a sparsely development community, it urbanized after 1901 as the Jacksonville area grew into Florida's first large major uh, urban center uh, and the largest urban center within the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage uh, Corridor. Eventually, the east side would fall into economic decline due to a variety of factors, including being decimated by multiple expressways, having its economic base ripped apart uh, by desegregation, um, as well as damage from what I refer to as the rebellion of 1969. Some people will call that the east side riots of 1969, as well as a legacy of redlining. Despite suffering the negative impacts of discriminatory public policies and investments, today it's still a largely intact community characterized by dense rows of late 19th century frame shotgun housing, historic churches, and mixed use commercial buildings, as well as uh, a network of interesting early 20th century uh, industrial um, structures. However, the fate in the neighborhood does face several challenges. Adjacent to downtown and the sports and entertainment district, several infill development projects and initiatives are already under construction or proposed, which have led to the demolition of significant cultural heritage sites that are considered to be important to uh, residents within the community. So limiting uh, displacement and erasure of that culture, while in addition providing opportunities for economic development, affordable housing, and historic preservation and quality and access to uh, healthy foods and economic infrastructure. Uh, all of these are major issues that the community has felt has needed to be addressed to make sure that residents living there today are a part of that vibrant future. So as uh, Charlie Chisholm once said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. That's pretty much what the east side with, with gentrification strategies have focus on. So with that in mind, uh, with gentrification also involves revamping the public policies to support a community's needs and long-term vision, even if that uh, community-led approach may not be considered to be uh, viewed as a traditional way of doing things in the pre preservation world, as well as the planning and economic development world. So the designation of a National Register Historic District is one approach that is being taken there. And this is intended to honor uh, its heritage, as well as provide residents with equitable access to federal tax uh, credits and grant programs without property right restrictions that are associated with the city's local historic uh, district designations that generally have led to displacement and gentrification in other communities uh, within the same region. Residents will also have an opportunity to learn more um, in advance when uh, there are developments that call for the demolition of what people believe are culturally uh, significant so resources within that community. And this is a great example of if they don't um, give you a seat at the table, you bring your folding chair. A second public policy modification that is underway also involves uh, the creation of a culturally appropriate uh, zoning overlay. And in short, the goal of this overlay is intended to modify zoning policies through better utilization of setbacks, ma maximum lot widths, building heights, 
uh, for example, uh, things that will help encourage and protect affordable housing, uh, protect the historic built environment and community legacy, by guiding higher uh, density mixed use infill development into places that are both uh, complementary for the community and market and supported by the market. In addition, collaboration outside of traditional planning has also been critical. Affordable housing and displacement are current issues in that community that can't uh, wait for planning studies or policy changes to take place. So thus, a restore and repair home program has been established to support long-term uh, residents and making improvements to their properties, ensuring that families can remain in safe, stable housing now and into the future. This program also sources bids from contractors who are based in the general area and surrounding neighborhoods, which also serves as an additional economic development mechanism for BIPOC and women on uh, contractors and construction workers, basically leading to that economic dollar recycling within the community. Uh, Project Boots is another program that is underway and is intended to increase home ownership, which is essential to creating generational wealth. So this program basically provides down, to, down payment assistance and home ownership training. Upon successful completion of this 12-month program, participants are then uh, able to purchase a new home within the community on the existing vacant lots. And all this is designed to fit within the proposed zone and overlay standards. And again, this is just an opportunity for this community to preserve its cultural heritage sense of scale in place, while also uh, taking advantage of economic opportunities that lead to the recycling of the dollar uh, within its borders. And so last but not least, um, finally, you know, economic um, worldly access to healthy foods within the community was also a big issue in the strategy that is currently being tackled within that with gentrification and redevelopment toolbox. So built in 1913, the Dev store, which is pictured here, was a long time market that closed in 2001. And so intended to promote culture and history via adaptive reuse and eradicate the community's uh, food desert status, this centrally located building is now being rehabilitated to house a nonprofit uh, grocery uh, market on the first floor, as well as a financial services her, uh, hub and community center uh, on the second floor. So in the end, as I turn this back over to Melissa, um, here's my contact information. Uh, I would hope that I'm more than happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Uh, so you can contact me via email or through a network of social media outlets uh, or my website at uh, thejacksonmag.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both to Corian and Ennis for sharing your presentations. I've really appreciated that and learned a lot from it. And I did have a few follow-up questions for you guys, if you don't mind and you have a little bit of time to continue with us today. I was wondering if you could share um, a little bit of your thoughts around how, um, like, adding businesses in innocent in your withinification examples you included like putting food um, grocery options into the neighborhood how could your examples in it maybe help um with obalaka as they're thinking through their strategy going forward well i think obalaka has already um tackled some of those examples you know when i think about you know commercial revitalization especially within uh, historic african-american communities uh, some of the most successful examples are those communities that have become a part of the Main Street program. And really what I like about the Main Street program is it, it helps a community kind of self-organize and, and find ways to brand and promote its own, its own legacy and, and story, which is very uh, important when you're talking about um, economic development that is really driven by a world where places have a unique sense of place and they're taking advantage of that. And so I, I think um, Opalock is in the beginning stages of that. But, you know, within my presentation, I mentioned the Deuces of St. Pete, uh, College Park, and in, uh, in Georgia. Those two are two great examples um, of success that has occurred. I think Opalock also, 
you know, given its history, um, has a, a very unique opportunity um, to leverage existing policies that, quite frankly, many you know African American communities um, have just not had the general knowledge about how to take advantage of the policies. And I think when we when we when we talk about preservation in general, I think we have to also accept the knowledge that this whole uh, uh, industry was pretty. Much but set up during segregation and it wasn't meant initially for African American communities. With that being said, there are, there are programs such as being designated as a national register district, historic district, that does uh, bring um, opportunities for additional financial resources for the preservation of structures. So I know that, you know, with the the trust, I know that Opalock is looking at ways to designate more properties within its boundaries uh, to the National Register of Historic Places and being able to take advantage of some of those resources um, that will help with their revitalization growth initiatives. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think that Obalaka has done so much to protect and capitalize that really, truly unique sense of place that it has. Uh, it's really one of a kind. Um, both of you guys, what do you think about um, you know being listed on the 11 to save? We had some conversations with other partners like the University of Florida. Do you want to talk about at all any of that work that the partnerships we have sort of started and are going to continue going forward? Yeah, I think a big a big positive uh, of the 11 to save program is the awareness that it brings to potential sites and communities throughout the state. That awareness plays a big role in securing additional funds or additional resources to help with various initiatives. So I think the, you know, the, the connection where um, the UF Historic Preservation Program is going to assist with um, a historic resources survey for the community, which hopefully one day will lead to um, more properties being on the National Register. That comes out of that. Uh, I also, um, you know, think you know the city hall being able to secure additional five hundred thousand through the recent African American cultural hist and historical grant program is another example of just when that awareness comes out of there, there's just opportunities um, that can lead to things that may have been obstacles within a community. Uh, those solutions not only starting to arrive but snowballing in, in in a in a way that revitalization happens in a much uh, faster and quicker pace. And Ennis, my last question for you, if you if you want to talk about it a little bit, is how can you see with gentrification and urban planning and historic preservation kind of coming together in that sweet spot for the future of Oak And we, you may have talked about some of those tactics already, but is there any other sort of overarching themes you'd like to hit on? Well, I, I think the overarching theme is that there's those no one solution or one trick pony type way of, of doing things. It's a it's a network of several things that come together to protect a community's legacy and story and, and, and allow for that legacy and story to also uh, grow from an economic development perspective for the people within that community. So, you know, all together, I, you know, I, I would just wrap it up again and say um, to get to, to where Opalock is going. It's got a history. Every place has a history. Every place has a story. Uh, there are tools that can be used to dig that history out to better promote that history. Uh, the Main Street program is a great way of doing that. An organization that it helps with local businesses within the community. Um, from a planning perspective, being able to look at ways to uh, make sure that zoning actually works for that community uh, is another way. And zoning policies that also kind of support the market but kind of guide the market in a way that protects the community is very important and you know just a just a awareness and going back to you know access to information is power so the more that we can engage uh, uh multicultural and uh community and culture and spread that information around the better the opportunity we have to uh see the development uh, truly vibrant places uh, where all segments and parts of society are economically benefited and included in that uh, revitalization process. And now, yeah. 
Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. I'm so glad you were able to join us in the conversation about Obalaka and telling the story with everyone. I think a lot of times people think that Florida doesn't, I'm sure you hear this, but Florida doesn't really have history. We're just, we were like born when Walt Disney came and that's not the truth at all. So I'm very excited that we have this sort of national platform to share some of Florida's really cool, special stories. So thank you. Thank you.